How to choose a writing sample for your graduate student application. This is probably top two, top three questions that I hear all the time because it's a really, really important one. The writing sample is a top three component of the application in my view, alongside obviously your statement of purpose, your kind of research statement, and your letters of recommendation. And really, if you really boil it down, if the writing sample is not um, one where you can put your best foot forward, it's going to be really difficult to make the case if you are a potential advisor for admitting somebody. I have seen applications get so far in the process before someone says in the committee, I read the writing sample and I, I, I have some questions. Um, and, then, and then from there, you know, things can go really south. So how to choose what of your writings to include as your writing sample. That's what this tutorial is about. You need to think of your writing sample strategically. It needs to achieve certain things rather than just be a piece of writing. And I hope to make that clear over the course of this tutorial. Here are a few examples. If you're writing an application for a program where it is advantageous to have mastery of multiple languages, then something your writing sample can achieve is conveying your ability to conduct original research in primary sources in different languages. That's something that it can achieve. When I write an article uh, for a peer-reviewed journal, that's not my goal. My goal is to advance whatever it is that I'm working on to get my research published, to convey it through scholarly communication, of course, there are, you know, there are obviously career benchmarks associated with publishing, but I never publish an article thinking, I really need to prove to people that I can read Chinese. But when you apply to graduate school and you're giving a writing sample, you actually do <laughs> want to be able to convey to them, how do I tell them that I, I can do like serious primary research in Arabic, or I can really do work in Russian, or I can really do work and various methodologies. Well, the writing sample is one place where you can convey that. So what does that mean in practical terms? Well, let's say you've got two possible options for your writing sample. You have a really great paper that you wrote in college or, you know, and then maybe a piece of your honors thesis. I don't know what it might be. One factor, if you were my advisee, one thing that I would ask is which of these two potentials really struts your stuff when it comes to showing off the range of your abilities as a researcher, when it comes to various languages, when it comes to various genres of material, when it comes to different kinds of databases. If you have an amazing piece that is purely, let's say, purely English language kind of historiographic analysis, basically a literature review, and then you have another piece in which your footnotes are 30% English, 30% Chinese, 30% Ottoman Turkish, my advice to you as one person, but my advice to you would be seriously consider that second one because it's going to convey to a committee your capacity to do that in ways that this other one simply can't. Yes, you can have a CV that says, I have, you know, I am fluent in this language, I'm fluent in that. But is that true? Like, I don't mean you're lying, but, you know, fluent is a very, 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 very malleable term. And if I see a 30-page substantive uh, piece of writing in which someone has very clearly analyzed materials in other languages, that increases my confidence level. Like it shoots through the roof that yes, this person really does have Arabic. This person really does have Chinese or Japanese, especially if it's a language that, that I read and I can actually look and see what's going on or someone on the committee can. So when you are thinking about which writing sample to put forward, you don't want to just think about how rhetorically elegant it is, what grade you got. Those matter, but you also want to think about the footnotes, the bibliography. Does it really show off my capacities, my range? That's one factor. Another thing that a writing sample should strive to do, doesn't always achieve this, but should strive to do, is to convey a theoretical awareness of the discipline, the field to which you are applying. So if you can um, indicate by, again, through your footnotes, your bibliography, but also in your, the body of your text, if you can convey that you really do understand the kinds of debates that are going on or the prevalent 
theoretical paradigms that are at play here and now, then that is amazing. Because what it conveys to a committee, an admissions committee, is that this applicant kind of knows how scholarship works. It's not as if they just have a funny impression of scholarship, maybe by you know watching movies about professors or watching TV shows, or maybe they have a professor friend, but they really seem to have a sense of the internal workings of how it is that we talk with each other. Like what are concerns, the things that we actually think about on a weekly, monthly basis. And the ability to actually indicate an awareness of that goes a long way. So let's say you're, I don't know, a film student. If your last reference to a film was The Godfather or Star Wars and that's it, then you kind of leave it open for debate for the admissions committee to say, mm, like everybody knows The Godfather, like everybody, everybody knows Star Wars. Like I don't necessarily get a sense that this person actually understands what it is that we do and therefore actually understands what potentially they might be getting into if they get admitted to a program. Compare that to someone who says, you know, uh, you know, various references in the course of their, their written material, their writing sample. Yes, they have Godfather, they have Star Wars, but they also have some sort of obscure uh, Azerbaijani film that came out last year or a, an actual meaningful reference to a South Korean, you know, um, agitprop documentary that was, I don't know what it might be, but something which indicates that this applicant is really already a student of the subject matter. They have a lot to learn. We can teach them. That's what our program is here for. But they are already really, really well developed, really well on their way. And at least that's what's conveyed in the written material. So the writing sample, again, needs to achieve things. It doesn't just exist in a static sense. It needs to be achieving certain objectives. The first one I mentioned is to show your range, your capacities, in a research arena. And the second one is to try to indicate a maturity, a mature awareness of the theoretical paradigms and the reference points that are meaningful to those who are going to be on the opposite side of that admissions committee, on, that, on, on the opposite side of that table. Now this might raise the question, wow, now that he's pointing these things out, maybe I should like start an entirely new project where I really brush off my Ottoman Turkish and my and my ancient Assyrian, and I and I, and I and I go read a you know a hundred different journal articles, and I re no, 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 no. I mean, if you have nothing, if you have nothing in your hard drive that could even remotely work as a writing sample, then obviously you're going to need to write something from scratch, I guess. But barring that, assuming you have written material from your undergraduate, from your master's program, from an honors thesis, whatever it might be, from your career, let's say you're a career in journalism, I don't know what it might be. It is a far better option, in my view, to revise something than to attempt the act of writing something from scratch as, as uh, kind of utopian as that might sound, like as perfect and perfectionist as it might sound to just build something perfectly suited from, from scratch rather than revise something that's not really quite there. The reason is simple. If you have something that you've already worked on, then chances are it has already gone through some kind of review process. It was graded, it was revised, you revised it prior to submitting your honors thesis. Chances are you had more than one draft of your honors thesis before you submitted it. Or if you have something from your career after college in a written form, chances are your boss looked at it or your colleagues looked at it. And some various kinds of cognitive sandpaper has already polished that piece of writing and also stress tested it in certain ways that is going to make it nine times out of ten stronger as a piece of writing than something you come up with from scratch. From scratch you're still going to want to stress test it, you're still going to want to have people look at it, you're still going to have to go through all of those processes that in theory this other option has. So between the two, starting over and working with what you have, it is my view, just one person's view, that it is better to start with something that you have, but in a strategic way to think about how it can be augmented, edited, amended, to try to achieve some of those objectives that I brought up. For example, and I'm just telling you this, no one will know that if you took a piece of writing from your undergraduate days that was 
95% English or whatever, you know, whatever the dominant language is in your intellectual world is your, your mother tongue and 5% French, 5% a kind of research language, there is absolutely nothing to stop you from revising that piece and augmenting the French language material in the bibliography or in the text. There is nothing in the world that prevents you from adding a number of sources in German. Let's say that you have German, but you just didn't use German for that paper. And then you say, well, I'm gonna go read some German things and I'm going to find a home for it in a reasonable, ethically responsible, intellectually responsible way in this source so that at least the admissions committee knows that I have English, I have French, and I have German. That's what I want to achieve with this. It is entirely okay to go back to the literature review portion of some undergraduate paper you have and augment it to try to bring it back to date, up to date by reading some you know, new journal articles, some cutting edge work coming out, some recent award winners. It is entirely okay to augment, edit, revise in such a way that again tries to achieve these strategic objectives that every writing sample needs to achieve. It needs to be well-written. It needs to be on a non-obvious subject. It needs to be based on primary sources. Those are all kind of core and key. It needs to be well-argued, obviously, but it can also achieve these other strategic objectives of demonstrating your range as a researcher and demonstrating your general kind of awareness and maturity as a thinker within this discipline, whatever discipline, whatever kind of department or subfield, let's say, that you're applying to. It sounds scary, but really what I'm, I'm not talking about much here. I'm not talking about an entire like blow it up and rebuild it. I'm talking that you want in the course of this writing sample, you want to, obviously you're trying to impress an admissions committee, but there's something else that, that you're really trying to do, which is if they are drawn to the other parts of your application, your right, your I'm sorry, your letters of recommendation, your your um, your cover letter research statement, what you're really doing in the writing sample is assuaging their concerns or fears that you might not actually be ready for grad school, or that you might not really understand what it is you're getting into, because both things happen quite a lot. There are people that are admitted to grad programs who really didn't know what they were getting into, and that causes problems for everybody. That caused problems for the student, but it also causes problems for the department who has decided to bring on someone who you know, may not be, may not stay um, for, for, for any number of reasons. And so this is true at many different stages of academia. We don't often talk about this, but admissions committees, job search committees, postdoc committees, fellowship committees, maybe less fellowship committees, but those other committees are actually trying to do their job really well and are really nervous about screwing up. And screwing up in this case would be um, not, you know, not, not knowing, not understanding that maybe someone wasn't a good fit for the program, that someone wasn't, uh, didn't really know again what they were getting into. And so, the whole package of the application material is definitely about conveying your, your abilities, your capacities, why this is a good resonant fit between you and the program. But there is a portion of it where you are calming the fears of the admissions committee themselves who do not want to make a bad choice. They are human on the other side of that as well. So just some things to think about when you're deciding what of your, you know, voluminous writings, whatever, all of the things that you've ever written in your life, which of them to set aside and say, this is the one I'm going to work on. This is the one I'm going to edit, augment, amend, revise, and put forward as a good reflection of who I am, but one that also achieve, uh, that achieves particular strategic objectives of my application as a whole. I'll see you in the next tutorial.